So um, I was, uh, so the last um, Genomic Medicine 4, I gave an overview of the payers meeting that we had at the end of October. And you'll be relieved to know I'm not going to give the, the same overview again. Um, but I thought I was asked to just come up here and uh, give a brief overview of one or two of the things that we've been working on um, since. Um, and, and just to explain for those of you who weren't at the meeting, this came out of Genomic Medicine 3. And the idea was to look at coverage and reimbursement issues, particularly looking at some of those creative solutions where there's a lack of clinical, demonstrated clinical utility, but there's promising evidence. So um, Steve Furrow yesterday talked about the coverage of evidence development for warfarin testing. So someone from um, CMS came and talked about that. Um, we had some, uh, we, ha we also learned about this arrangement between United Health and um, genomic, genomic health um, regarding uh, Oncotype DX reimbursement and, and so on. And there's a summary of the um, entire uh, proceedings that's on the web and available. So these were the main action items that came out of uh, the meeting. The first one, the white paper, was just summarizing some of the things that we learned, some of the emerging themes from the workshop, and just getting out there. Some of the, there are these creative solutions that people can consider. I'm not going to talk much about that. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, the data sharing, legal and policy issues. Um, I'm, I'm going to mention the research on physician ordering of genetic tests, um, and, and also mention that Mark's going to say a word or two about that after I'm done. Um, these bottom two, um, last time I was saying that they hadn't yet been taken up. Um, these still haven't been taken up, and it looks like until, unless we um, do something about these ourselves or come up with this different solution, these two, the, the, those people who volunteer to do those have not been able to um, lead those efforts. So the first one was the observation that are all, there are all these tests that are out there with a clear lack of demonstrated clinical utility. Are there criteria we could create to prioritize some of those if we're going to fund some research? And the second one was conceptually, is there some kind of way we could set up an infrastructure model um, that could perform some clinical utility research, develop um, some of the evidence? So I, what I was going to do is um, return to these and some other things you might want to think about at the end. So going back to the data sharing legal and policy issues, so this was the, the discussion that we had at the meeting around this was that the, uh, as is commonly discussed, there's a lot of information that's already out there, if only we could mine it. Um, some of these creative solutions um, for coverage of their developments and so on, they require data sharing, uh, the sharing of data between payers, then test developers, and perhaps physician offices, academia, and so on. So we had an initial call to discuss this issue. Pearl O'Rourke was on the call, um, Brad Malin as well as well as Kate Kohler from um, Maween's group. And we discussed all the various laws that might apply, some of which, of course, we're familiar with, HIPAA and the common rule. Um, there are also state laws. And then there was one which, quite frankly, I'd not heard of before, the Financial Services Modernization Act, which payers have to pay attention to. Um, but what, what became apparent was that we really need to define exactly what we want to do here. Because depending on who's sharing their data with whom and for what purpose, whether it's aggregated or not, or the, the, um, whether these laws apply are very different. Um, so what we can, I, I think what we can conclude from that conversation, we need to really better define the scenarios that we're, we're looking at and to conduct some further research. Um, since the call, we've not made an, uh, a great deal of progress on this, but. Um, I have a new staffer coming onto my branch in the next month, and that's going to be one of the things that she's going to be working on. So um, I, I, another, uh, of, of course, is again, is another common theme that comes out of a lot of these meetings is that often physicians don't know exactly what it is there. They may order the wrong test. They have sufficient knowledge and so on. And so Mark has been leading a group of stakeholders to discuss what we um, might want to do about this. 
Um, we've had, it's very much the information gathering stage at the moment. We've had a, a couple of calls. Ira Lubin at the CDC has talked about research he's done, including how to report um, research to physicians. Chris Miller at ARUP Labs has talked about the research they've done where they often find that physicians are simply ordering the wrong test or the um, reordering the same test or the, the lots of um, poor practices there. And we also have heard from Becky Turner. She's at Palmetto GBA, which is one of the, um, the one of the MACs that was talked about at the CMS talk yesterday. Um, they they cover California, Nevada, and Hawaii. And uh, Palmetto has been um, famous, I, I guess, in the last year or two, in that they've been doing a, a, a lot of work and setting up the Mall DX program to better track exactly what it is they're paying for. And so what they've found is that often physicians are, um, or the, a lot of the test ordering they see is inappropriate for the Medicare patients which they serve. So uh, once I'm done, I will um, pass it on to Mark to say a little bit more about what we've learned on that so far. So, so that, that's where we are with the payers meeting. I also wanted to let you know about one or two other things that are going on. Um, NHGRI is involved with um, HHS on a, a project which emerged out of um, NHGRI achieving a GIPRA goal. I don't know how <coughs> familiar you all are with GIPRA, but this is a law um, which was established during the Clinton years where each agency in the federal government has to establish benchmarks and to meet those benchmarks to show that the, um, the government is performing well. And NHGRI had one to where we were tracking lowering the costs of sequencing and we had to um, meet certain thresholds within a certain amount of time. And um, HHS was particularly excited by um, NHGRI achieving this goal and they said, well, what more can we at HHS do to help foster the clinical use of sequencing, whether it's whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing or whatever? Um, so this is something that been, we've been working on for a while now, and um, it, it, this goes beyond coverage and reimbursement um, per se, and this would be focused on anything that really fits within the agencies within HHS. Um, so it, it's still in the very early stages. Um, HHS has paid for a contractor to look through um, reports that have been done over the past few years, whether it's the Genomics Roundtable, the IOM, or SACJHS, and to pull out any recommendations that um, for, for HHS or agencies within HHS for specific actions they could take. Um, and they're also uh, re they're forming a number of expert panels. So there's a number of people in the room here actually will be contacted by HHS or the contractor if they haven't done already. Um, Jeff, I made a note here. Jeff Ginsburg, Dan Roden, uh, Cecily Sessions, uh, Deborah Leonard, and Bruce Korf. They're, they're, um, they're all on the list of people that they may contact. Um, and the, the, the basic question they'll be asking will be what can, what, what is it that HHS should be doing that they aren't doing, whether it's NIH, CDC, ARC, or whoever. And um, Following up from that, there's going to be this trans-HHS working group, which is going to take all this information and decide uh, what should be done. And I, while I'm talking about this, I should uh, acknowledge Ansel and Stuart, um, way in the back there, who's leading this project at, at HHS. Um, so, so something else we also are doing within DIPSI is we're um, tracking uh, what, what, what's been going, what, what's um, going on with regard to coverage and reimbursement. Um, this was brought up um, yesterday, but um, in, in, in passing. Um, but I was mentioning that we really want to keep an eye on US preventive services, uh, the, the, the last meeting, um, we really want to keep an eye on US preventive services task force recommendations because they have um, heightened power, for want of a better word now, in that. Um, any recommendation from, let's say, an AOB from the US PSTF has to be covered by non-grandfathered 
um, plans per the Affordable Care Act. And the MIPA, the, the uh, revised law for Medicare, it also allows Medicare to cover preventive services that they wouldn't otherwise be able to cover um, that are USPS, TF, um, A's and B's. Um, and so w um, there is little within the task force recommendations that pertain, pertain to genomics uh, specifically. Um, but there was a recommendation, arguing back, <clears throat> excuse me, to 2005 um, on BRCA testing. But there was a question as to um, whether, that, whether the recommendation covered the genetic counseling or whether it covered the testing itself. And so, of course, this had important um, ramifications for the Affordable Care Act and what private plans were going to be required to cover. So since, the, um, since Genomic Medicine 4, the Department of Labor and HHS and the Treasury have put out a, an FAQ, and one of the things they clarified that they, are, they expect um, the coverage both of the genetic counseling and the, the testing. So that's just an FYI. And, and uh, something else that you may, just in passing, may also be interested in is um, a recent MEDCAC meeting. MEDCAC stands for Medicare Evidence Development Coverage Advisory Committee. <laughs> um, so they had a, and, and they are the advisory committee for the coverage group within um, Medicare. Um, and their role is to assess the level of evidence for a test and say, does this meet um, clinical validity? Does there is a clinical utility to this test? And Medicare, um, th this, this did not determine Medicare decisions, but they use this information to help advise, inform the, the decisions. So they had a, a meeting on the 1st of May, and the, what they were focused on was tissue of origin tests, so where you have cancers, where you don't know where the primary site is. There are a number of tests that are out there now that claim using um, panel, looking at um, activity across a bunch of genes and um, using an algorithm, they can predict where the primary site is. Um, so they looked at uh, uh, three different tests, and they found um, moderate evidence of clinical validity, but little evidence of utility. And I, I, it was interesting to watch the discussion. I think it was very emblematic of what we're facing in terms of how um, there was little evidence out there to just demonstrate some of the tests that um, sound promising we may ultimately want to see covered. Um, so this is just this is my last slide. The, the top two things I have here are the the criteria for the prioritizing tests and this the the idea the conceptual of some kind of um, way in which clinical utility research could be performed. Um, these are the things that I've I've just thrown up there as other things that w um, we might want to consider and which uh, thinking more about and which I brought up at, at Genomic Medicine for. Um, Mark mentioned yesterday the fact that genetic counselors aren't um, covered as independent providers under Medicare. Um, I don't know how much that is we want to prioritize or work on, promote. Um, then I, I wonder, um, probably done. I don't, know, I don't know what button I hit here. It says end of slideshow, does that mean I'm, does that mean I'm cut off? <laughs> I can take a hint. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, we often, we rarely really try to define what tests are appropriate for coverage right now um, and where there's clear clinical utility. Um, are, or are there tests um, that if tied to some kind of creative solution whereby there's ongoing um, gathering of information tied to coverage um, for a while, like a coverage of evidence development kind of thing, are there tests or services or things that are out there that are valuable? And for whom? But one, one of the challenges I think that we face is some of the things that we would like to see um, for uh, genomic medicine aren't necessarily appropriate for the Medicare population, aren't necessarily for over 65s. And yet um, Medicare is often used as a benchmark for private covers, um, healthcare insurers. So 
Do we want to think about the fact that there may be services or testing that we want to see covered but isn't covered by Medicare, and how do we want to go about that? Um, so I guess the, the last thing, the, the last bullet actually is a bit repetitive, analysis of what's covered and what we think ought to be covered. So I'll leave those up for there, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Mark to talk more about the physician ordering of testing, a group that he's been leading. <laughs> 